to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. So, so much for family values. What a troubling gospel. If not for the way that Jesus makes short shrift of the so-called Christian family, then for all of this conflict he is advocating, it's a gospel message that doesn't really sit so easily with us. Especially considering our world today and our longing for peace in Ukraine, in the Middle East, reading about the near genocide of the Uyghurs in China, and considering the universal but more private struggles against the perpetuation of violence in the home, within sometimes our own families. It's shock, horror even, at this passage. What is Jesus saying? I always thought he was supposed to be the peace and love guy. I think if you're surprised at this morning's gospel, it arises from the very human, spiritual need to bring scripture into our hearts and make that scripture come alive for us today. We do that unconsciously every time we read the Bible. We hear it speaking to us right here and right now. And that is how scripture is supposed to be read. Not as some dry academic endeavor or history that is completely unrelated to us, but as the Holy Spirit speaking in our own hearts. But the problem arises, as with a passage such as today's gospel, when we just uncritically appropriate Jesus' words that were spoken in a galaxy long, long ago, and far, far away, which is vastly different from our world today. The world, then, 2,000 years ago, and particularly the structure of the family, is almost unrecognizable to our assumptions and mores today. There was no democracy in the Roman state. There was no 1950s family fantasy land. Marriage was a tool of the state. If you were a slave or had come from a recently conquered land, you were not even allowed ever in your lifetime to enter into marriage. If you were an unmarried adult and as a slave or a conquered person, you would always be relegated to that. Then you were under the absolute control of your father or your master, which amounted basically to the same thing. If you were a married woman, you were under the power of your husband's family. His father, unless your husband was the oldest male in his line, but daily you would be under the thumb of your mother-in-law. The paterfamilias, the head of the household, had life or death control over everyone in his little fiefdom. He could sell or even kill any member of the family with legal impunity. Now, given that type of a family structure, I am guessing that Jesus' words to the people of his own time were even more inflammatory than they are to our ears today. Because the division he is calling for is between the generations. Another way to say in the family structure, along the power lines of the state. I have come to break open this unjust power structure of the Roman state. I have come to overthrow everything that is unjust and oppressive. The coming of the reign of God, says Jesus, it will tear apart the family as you know it. In order to, quote another prophet, that God's justice may roll down like waters and God's righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Something has to die in order to make room for God's transforming power. Now, how does that message play out in our own time? Well, not so long ago, it was our American forebears who took this message to heart when they wished to be free from England's tyrannical rule in order to be creating and transforming the nation they wanted to become It required first not peace, but division. And today, if you look all around the world, people who are working for freedom and for justice often find themselves amidst discord, if not civil war. 
On a personal level, this often speaks to people who are coming out of drug or alcohol abuse. When someone like that seeks to transform their lives, the recovering user encounters all sorts of power structures from the past life that need to be severed in order to enter into a new way of being. And not just the relationship between the person and their drug of choice, but relationships with everyone in their life using drugs who for one reason or another want, usually unconsciously, to keep that person in a state of dependency to drugs. But we don't have to be addicts to find ourselves struggling against those bonds that tie us into a life of sin and keep us from being open to God's transformation. I had the opportunity to work as a chaplain for a year just after I graduated from seminary. And I was working with a small group of chaplains who were all, of course, attempting to transform themselves, if not into the image of Christ, at least into the image of a slightly better chaplain. Our group included the following. A retired recovering alcoholic Catholic priest, a wounded urban pastor, a woman with a history of severe sexual abuse that crippled her functioning in daily life, a slightly depressed Lutheran pastor, and myself. And we discovered, working together in that county hospital in downtown Minneapolis, how difficult it is to achieve transformation in one's own life. Every time any of us tried to make a change, there was something holding us back, whether it were the internal voices in our own hearts and minds or the external voices of relationships from people we cared about, trying to put us back into that old container. To achieve real transformation, we needed to engender division, not keep the peace with structures that kept us chained to our old selves. I remember repeated frustration with a particular member of the chaplain group, the Lutheran pastor. He was really only comfortable with elderly women patients, you know, those who were by and large sweet and passive, and regardless of his bumbling efforts, would always be counted upon to be kind to him. When he was confronted with the aftermath of gang violence, a family enraged over the tragic death of a child, an obstinate pregnant woman, he couldn't cope. He was unable to reach out as a chaplain and offer himself in these situations because he worried that these people might reject him. And he could understand that dynamic so clearly in his head. But when it came to the chaplaincy encounter, he could not change his behavior. So week after week, I had this image of Mark standing at the edge of a great pool, trying to cautiously wade in at the shallow end, not making any headway. And I could not understand why he would not just go around to the deep end and jump in and get it over with once and for all. Just do it. Tiptoeing around in the shallows was not getting him anywhere, but I knew because I knew him that he was not the kind of person that would ever be able to take the risk of diving in to the deep end. The structures that bound him were not, as in Jesus' day, familial, state-supported power structures, but they were family power structures from his childhood. And he was firmly bound to them, and they were just as strong. The only way for him to be transformed was to confront those powers, set himself against them, and break free. Christian transformation is not all sweetness and light. It's backbreaking work sometimes. It's difficult, sometimes without great rewards in this world. And perhaps it is the very power of the good news in Jesus Christ that makes that good news so threatening to the powers of this world. It's as Jesus said at the beginning of this gospel, I have this deep desire for this fire and I wish it were already kindled, but not quite yet. The fire of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost coming down and lighting on the heads and in the hearts of each and every Christian to open us 
to the change that Jesus calls us to. Now in the end, in this gospel, I, to be honest, am not really sure where to go. Because gospel texts are often troubling. If we find the right translation or interpretive key, we can hit Peter. But sometimes the gospel texts are so troubling that they completely resist being domesticated for our use. They're like fire, or like the hammers breaking against the rocks that would keep us being too comfortable in the face of the call of Christ to each and every one. I invite you to stand for our affirmation of faith found in your pillars of faith on page three. We believe in God. 